think often we uh, look at our own lives and we, we think I have so little that I can give to, give to the Lord, especially in comparison to what He's given me. And uh, I think at those times we should be reminded of the parable of the talents where the Lord gave to His, uh, to his servants the, in the parable. Uh, different talents. They didn't all get the same amount. Some of them, one of them got ten talents, another was five, another was one. And yet they were all to be faithful until the Lord returned. And uh, I think we should also <laughs> examine our hearts and not say, how much has God given me to serve and to use Him, but am I using what He's given me for His service? And that's really the subject of our study today. We're looking at the book of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, if you'd Open there in your Bibles and follow along. We'll be, we often will begin a sermon by reading just one verse or, or, and then expanding into the context. Or maybe sometimes we'll read a whole passage and then go back through it verse by verse. But today I'd like to give you a little context before we begin in the Gospel according to Luke. Now you'll see there, probably in your Bible, before the chapter 1 of, of Luke, you'll probably see a title that says, The Gospel According to Luke. Now, that, those words were not written by Luke. <laughs> Someone else wrote those in later. And uh, what Luke begins, how he begins his gospel is in verse 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration and, and so on. We'll, we'll examine those words in just a minute, but in order to understand what's going on, I think we need to, we need to examine at least three people in this passage the first one is going to be Luke. The second one is going to be a man named Theophilus. And the third one is a man named Zechariah. Now, but before, we, before we do that, we've got to start with Luke. How do we know that Luke wrote this gospel? Because he didn't put his name on it. Uh, he writes and speaks about himself. He talks about how he's writing to a man named Theophilus, but he didn't put his name in the gospel. In fact, it says in the book of Acts that... It is a sequel to the book of Luke. Uh, if you look at Acts chapter 1, it says, The former treatise have I made unto thee, O Theophilus. And we see here in verse 3 that uh, this book of Luke was written to Theophilus. So you have Acts as a sequel to Luke, written by the same person. But in the book of Acts, we also do not have the name of Luke. How do we know that Luke wrote it? Well, it's because the people who knew Luke, all the way back in the first century, we have people who would have known Luke wrote about how Luke wrote this gospel. Um, so we are very sure, not because it's some tradition that's been handed down, but because we have historical records of people as early as those who knew Luke themselves who said that Luke wrote it and no one ever said, no, he didn't. <laughs> not a single a historical record that challenged that is very clear then that Luke wrote the letter. It's also fairly clear that Luke had to, even if we had, didn't have that uh, attestation, uh, it's also fairly clear that the book of Acts was written by Luke because it's written by someone, according to Acts chapter 16, who was with Paul for his missionary journey. Now, this is a very important fact about Luke. Luke traveled with the apostle Paul, at least starting in Acts 16. When he begins to go into Macedonia, it says, when Paul had a vision saying, uh, from the Macedonians saying, come over and help us, it says that we endeavored to go meaning Luke is now including himself as one who is traveling with Paul and endeavoring to go to Macedonia. We don't know when he started traveling with Paul, but it had to be at least by that point in Paul's ministry. So then we know that Luke was a traveler with Paul. We can see this in a couple places. Look at, if you will with me, at the Colossians chapter 4. Here's the two times. I'm going to start with one in Colossians, and I'll take you to the other in a moment. But in Colossians, we see the first of the two times that the name Luke is used in the Bible. Colossians gives us his name <clears throat> in chapter 4 as Paul is concluding the epistle to the Colossians. This is probably earlier in Paul's ministry. But in chapter 4, verse 14, it says, we'll start in verse uh, 12, actually. Epaphras, Paul writes, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, 
and then in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Now, Paul is writing to the Colossians, and the Colossians are being told by Paul that as he's writing, with him are a couple people, Epaphras and Luke and Demas. Now later, Paul writes about how Demas forsook him, having loved the pre- this present world, but um, Epaphras and Luke are, are um, uh, never said to have forsaken him. Luke here, in, at this time, is traveling with Paul and is there giving salutation to the Colossians along with Paul. Perhaps it's even Luke who's penning the letter of the Colossians as Paul dictates it to him. This is possibly the case since Paul says that when he writes with his own hand, he writes with a very large letter. He probably had some problem with his eyes. And Luke was very, pos- very likely the one who is uh, writing for him. Notice what else we learn about Luke in verse 14. He is a beloved physician. Now, beloved means that everybody knows about him. Luke is the beloved physician. People know about Luke. You know Luke, he's saying to the Colossians. Of course, you know Luke. Everybody knows who Luke is, probably because of Luke's gospel, as we will examine momentarily. Um, But he's beloved and he's a physician. That's a very interesting fact about Luke, because in that time, just as really, I guess, I suppose you could say today, it took a lot of training and education to become a physician. Now, thankfully, as far as I know, if if it's not the case, please don't tell me any different. I think it requires a lot of training and education to become a physician today. I would hope so. Um, But today, it takes a lot of training and education to become a lot of different things. Back then, there were only a few few sort of... um, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Your job, your... um, There you go, occupations that required large amounts of, uh, of education, and this was one of them, the, to be a physician. Luke would be a very well-learned person. He would be, we see in the book of Luke that he's very well-written. And then, if we fast forward to the very end of Paul's ministry, to 2 Timothy, we see the second mention of Luke. We see that Luke was not only there uh, when Paul was writing to the Colossians, which may have been in the 50s um, A.D., But he's also there in the 60s A.D., 10 years or more later, when Paul was about to die. He was imprisoned by the hands of the Romans, was soon to be martyred for the cause of Christ. And in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, uh, verse 10, it says this, For Demas hath forsaken me. So Demas hung there with Paul for a while and then forsook him. It says, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatians, uh, Titus to Dalmatia. They had all gone on their separate ways, some for good reasons, some for bad reasons. But verse 11 says, uh, Paul writes, only Luke is with me. (laughs) After all of Paul's uh, missionary journeys, Luke, the beloved physician, stuck with him And now Paul is probably about to die and Luke is still with him. Everyone else is gone, but Luke stays. And um, Paul writes more about others, Mark and and others, that he he wants to see. So we see then a little bit about Luke. Luke is a very well educated man, he is a companion of Paul. He would have certainly known the teachings of Paul very well. Maybe and most likely was the person who penned most of the letters by Paul. He was the one who wrote them down as as Paul dictated them to him. Um, And uh, he was was a physician. He stayed with Paul all the way to the very end. And it's very likely that Paul, with his thorn in in the flesh, as we read in 2 Corinthians, and and the many ailments that Paul uh, likely had, uh, that the, having a physician traveling with him was <laughs> very beneficial. Um, so Timothy here, uh, not excuse me, not Timothy, uh, Luke, we, we find to be a very, uh, a very important companion. One other passage I'll read as we, as we begin our study of Luke in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. This appears to be a reference to Luke in the book of 2 Corinthians, which means that Luke would have written his gospel very early. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it says this uh, in verse 18. Um, 
Well, let's back up just a little bit. You'll see similar phrasing here in verse 16. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care in the heart of Titus for you. He's talking to the Corinthians. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, being, uh, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Now, before we know that Luke was called the beloved physician, here there is a brother who has a lot of praise because of his work in the gospel throughout all the churches. Now, most scholars will say that this is probably referring to Luke because he wrote the gospel. He became well known among many of the churches because of his work that we're about to examine here. So, um, suffice it to say that what we're about to examine by the hand of Luke is a very powerful, uh, a very powerful work. And from the time that it was written, it was considered among the early churches in the first century to be a very important resource to remember and to know the things that Jesus said and taught and, and the life and ministry of Christ. So, because of that, we now begin and analyze what Luke has to say. Look at the first verse of Luke, chapter 1. It says this, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Now, the first four verses of the book of Luke are written in a very high Greek language, a very high formal form of Greek. As a matter of fact, there's several words in the first four verses of Luke that are not found in any other place in the Bible. They're the only time that that Greek word is used in the Bible is in the first four verses of Luke. Several words like that. And the reason is because Luke is writing a very formal high Greek introduction to his gospel. He wants this to be a very educated work of historical fact that he's researched. Watch what he says. For as much as many have taken in hand, that means that that phrase taken in hand means that they've attempted, they've, they've, they've made the attempt to set forth in order a declaration or a, a narration. That word is translated from the Greek word diegesis, which means a narrative. Uh, many have taken in hand to set forth in order a, a declaration or a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So follow his, follow, I know this is a very formal wording and it's hard for us to follow, but what he's saying here is he's saying there's a lot of people who have heard the stories that the apostles have, have, have told us about Jesus and have attempted to put them in an order, uh, in a narrative order, so that we can give it to you, so we can give it to people. And he says, I know that a lot of people have tried this and have attempted it, um, and they've, got, they've done it for good reasons. They've gotten it from the apostles, from those who heard Jesus, and they've tried to put it down in order. Verse 3, he's not criticizing the others who've attempted to do it during his time, but he says, but it seems good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. So he says that that, that phrase, having had perfect understanding, it, it's, it, I don't think I'm going to be able to pronounce it correctly. It's, it's a Greek word, uh, peric. Perikalutheo, I think. It's a very long word. These are one of these words are very, very impressive. <laughs> I couldn't use words like this if they were English. Um, but Luke uses this word, and the word means to investigate, to follow something very carefully. What he's saying here is it seemed good to me also, having followed this very carefully, having investigated all of the claims from all the way back from the beginning of the gospel. And we see that Luke begins earlier than any of the other gospel writers, of course, except for John, who begins at the beginning, and the beginning was the word, right? But otherwise, other than John, Luke does begin earlier than Matthew or Mark. He, he starts all the way back with Zechariah, as we'll see in, in a moment, uh, time permitting. Um, but Luke begins very early in his gospel because he's researched all the way from the very beginning the claims this person said that. Is there corroboration for that? What's going on here? Let me follow this piece of evidence. Let me, this piece of eyewitness testimony, let me check on that. Let me see if that's true. 
this person said this and that person said that and let me compile all this, let me put it in order, let me, let me um, whittle it down to the things that people really need to know. That's what he's been doing. Why has he done this? Well, the answer seems pretty obvious. Luke didn't believe it at first either. <laughs> he starts hearing, he's, here he is, a physician. Most likely it's guessed that he was probably from Antioch, which is where Paul was sent out from his missionary journeys. If he's a uh, Luke being a Gentile name, he's not a Jewish person, he's a physician in, in probably in the city of Antioch, and he comes across all these Christians, and there's a very large Christian church in Antioch, and they start saying about how this, this man, this Messiah of the Jews, is, he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, and, and that he was doing all these miracles, he's, they make all these claims, and Luke as a physician says, i got to look at this, i got to figure out if this is true, I mean, because... If one person said it, I'd just say this is crazy, but I'm getting all these people who are telling me they saw this, they saw it. Uh, I can't just dismiss this because I don't want to believe it. It's gotta be, there's got to be something to this. So he begins to examine uh, all of this evidence for himself, and now he comes across this man who we'll discuss in a moment, Theophilus, and he says, it seemed good to me, Theophilus, to write to you the things I've already investigated. I had to investigate them myself. I didn't just believe them. I didn't just say, well, that must be true. Let me just jump on that bandwagon and die for it because people are getting put to death for this. No, when people told me this was true, I said, I've got to figure out, is that really true? And so he did. He says, I've, I've carefully investigated. I've followed. I've had perfect understanding of all things from the first. Luke was a scholar. <laughs> As a matter of fact, historians have looked at Luke's gospel and have said, this is, this is one of the highest order of historical documents that we can find from this time anywhere. I mean, the, his statements of, of, of fact are not only true. I forget the exact statement. There's, a, there's a several well-known statements about, the, about how historians look at the book of Luke. But they say this is very much, very true history, what he writes. Uh, it's very clear that he's very specific and careful about it. Now, he says this to a man named Theophilus. So we see Luke's goal is to provide evidence, facts that he has evidence, that he's researched, that he's, he's looked into, he's providing eyewitness testimony, and he's doing it to a man named Theophilus. Now, what do we know about Theophilus? Well, I wish we knew a lot more. <laughs> we don't know as much as I wish we knew, but Theophilus, his name means a lover of God or a friend of God. Theo, meaning God, and Phyllis, from um, uh, the same word we get Philadelphia from a brotherly sort of love, a friendship with God. Now, Theophilus may have had this name from a child. This is, this is a Greek wording. It's not some sort of Hebrew name. So it might have been uh, that uh, his mother, uh, maybe an unbeliever, named him Theophilus because he was to be a friend of one of the gods. You know, it's possible. But it's more likely, most have suggested, that this is probably a name that he's taken since He's become a Christian. Now, it may be that, the, that Theophilus is a Christian. It may be that he's not a Christian. We're not sure. But either way, Luke wants to disciple him in the faith. Whether he is or isn't a Christian yet, he wants him to either become a Christian or to become a better Christian. It says here, I, I wanted to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. Now, this phrase, most excellent, is used in the book of Acts by Luke. Um, but it's, well, it's a recording. He's recording what the Jews say to, I believe it was King Agrippa. And so we know that the phrase most excellent in Greek is definitely referring to a very, a person of very high importance. Here, Theophilus must have been maybe a governor, maybe some, some political person in some place of political authority or power. Whoever he is, the, the phrase most excellent tells us that he's of higher status. Now, understand I, what, what Luke is doing here. He's, he's seeing an opportunity to evangelize Theophilus, either to evangelize or disciple him. Evangelism meaning to bring him to faith in Christ, or discipling meaning to cause his faith in Christ to grow and, and his understanding to be greater. Why does Luke see such an opportunity to evangelize or to disciple Theophilus? Because Luke is put in a position to uniquely be able to speak to someone of, of high rank who's looking for intelligent, well-thought-through, investigated arguments. 
Now, most of the, most of the, of the apostles were not highly educated people. They were right. I mean, they were passing on eyewitness testimony. But uh, of the apostles, really the only one who was very educated was Paul. And Paul was educated as a Pharisee, as this Jewish Pharisee. So Luke, who's educated as a, a, a Gentile physician, has a, per, a particular ability to be able to speak to the Gentile Theophilus, who's, who's in some position of authority, and give him the evidence and the arguments that he would need. You see, Luke sees an opportunity. Luke's argumentation and his deep thinking is not going to convince everyone. Some people don't need that. Some people get lost in the weeds. But he knew Theophilus needed it. He knows Theophilus needs an apologetic. He knows Theophilus needs well-researched facts. So he sees Theophilus and says, obviously God has equipped me to give Theophilus what he needs. Now this is just fascinating. And as we watch what he says to Theophilus, we see a couple important points. So let's not, let's not slow down here. Let's continue on. Verse 4 that thou mayest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. I looked up the Greek word behind no and certainty, and guess what it means? No and certainty. <laughs> Didn't have to change that one at all. <laughs> right? That was just right. That thou mayest know the certainty, meaning he's saying, just, I know you've been told a lot about Jesus. I want you to know the things that are absolutely certain because I've researched them. I've found testimony here. I've looked to see if there's corroboration. Well, who, who's here? Well, who's, you said someone else was there. Who else was there? Okay, I'm going to go ask that person to see if that person was there and if they're going to say the same thing that you said to make sure that we can compare these accounts. Paul was uh, encouraged his, his listeners to do this. Remember in Acts 17 when Paul goes to the city of Berea and he preaches to the Jewish people in the synagogue at Berea, and the Jewish people in the synagogue, they don't accept or reject what Paul says. They said, okay, that's an interesting, that's an interesting teaching, Paul. Let's go look it up in the Old Testament, and we'll, we'll come back to you after we've studied it out. They go to the Old Testament, they look it up, and Luke writes in the book of Acts, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures whether those things were so. Uh, look at, if you will, at the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. This is how Paul operated and no doubt um, was very attractive to Luke, who was, a, who was a scholarly researcher. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this to the Corinthians uh, as, a, as a foundation to argue against the false doctrine that some were teaching in Corinth that, the, that there was no resurrection of the dead. He says this in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, wherein also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures." And that he was seen. He says, all right, here's the claim that Christ fulfilled the scriptures, dying for our sins, rising from the dead. Here's the proof. Verse 5. He was seen of Cephas, that is Peter. And uh, then of the twelve. By the way, Jesus was first seen by women. But Paul is providing a scholarly argument. In their time, it was not a scholarly argument to present uh, the, the testimony of women. I'm sorry, it's just the way that they thought back then. It's not wasn't right, it just was how they thought. So Paul jumps straight to the men who saw him to give a scholarly argument for the resurrection. He says, well, Peter saw him, and then all the 12 apostles saw him, and then after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Notice, he says, there was 500 people that saw him all at once, and he, he's import, it's very important to Paul that he mentions that the greater part of them are still alive. Why is he saying that? What does that matter? Well, so that you can go check it up. So you can go ask them. You can go talk to them. You can find out who was there, and then you go talk to, oh, who else was there? All right, go talk to that person. Paul's confident that doesn't matter who of the 500 that, are, that you can talk to, 
they're all going to uh, agree that yes, this really happened. None of them have recanted. None of them have changed their mind. You can go talk to any one of them. They're all going to tell you the same thing. 500 of them. So Paul likes to provide evidence. He also mentions in verse 7, after that he was seen of James. (laughs) James, the brother of Christ who didn't believe in him while he was working miracles and then changed his mind after he was put to death by the Romans. How can you explain that if he didn't rise from the dead? James, then uh, last of all, he was seen of me, me, I who was a Pharisee who wanted to kill Christians after they started claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. And then all of a sudden I started believing that Jesus rose from the dead? Explain that. Unless Jesus rose from the dead, there's no other explanation. So Paul likes to give eyewitness testimony and evidence for his claims, and he likes people to research them to see if they're true. The, the, he, he goes on to base his whole argument about the resurrection on the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. He says, look, if Jesus didn't rise, then we're all, then we're all most, most miserable. If it's not true, then, then what are we doing here? It's got to be true. I can prove that it's true. I've got eyewitness testimony. Luke here is writing to provide certainty to Theophilus, a man who, whether he was saved or not, was unsure about the truth of many of the claims he'd heard. So Luke says, all right, well, I've done a lot of research on this. Let me share it with you. I think there's a very important point that that we can make from this, but let's continue just a little further into the book of Luke chapter 1 to see how he applies this this principle to his first uh, subject, if you will, Zechariah. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now this tells us quite a bit about Zechariah, actually. In the days of Herod, we know when he lived. It was just a little little bit before the turning of the, of the well, I don't know, you wouldn't call it a century. I guess it was right before the B.C. turned to A.D., right? This is probably, uh, you know, six, some say four, some have argued maybe two B.C., but it's in that, in that range, in the days of Herod. Now, Luke is not just saying, oh, there was a time in some time. You know, he's giving exact timing. He says, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. And then he says, a certain priest named Zechariah. Now, there were thousands of priests uh, who filled these orders. So there's just uh, one of many priests. But he, he, he mentions that Zechariah is a priest. This is important because Theophilus is programmed, right? His mind thinks, oh, this guy's important. He's a priest. He's some sort of a leader in Israel. That's, I think, very important for for Theophilus as he considers this. Look what it says next. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Now, that was very important to mention because Elizabeth, her name was Greek. It's sort of translated into Greek, but it was the same name as Aaron's wife's name in the Old Testament, meaning like she was named after Aaron's wife. Like She's very important. She's also, the Levites could have married someone who wasn't a Levite, but here is Zechariah, a Levite, who married another Levite. So they're, you know, they're one and the same. They're, they're both together on this. Verse 6, they were both righteous before God. Now we know according to Romans 3.22, certainly Luke would have agreed with Romans 3.22 that the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ, which means they were faithful people. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, and they had no child. Oh, no. You see, the Jewish people of the time... Uh, you, can, you can look at ancient writings like the Mishnah and these kind of types of things. They talk about how, how you know if God has cursed you, if God is angry with you. And one of the ways you know that God is angry at you is if you have no children. I mean, the barren womb was a surefire way to know you'd done something to anger God. They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they were both now well stricken in years. They passed the age. It's, they've passed the window even if she wasn't barren. It was too late. So they had this great privilege. Look what it says in verse 8. It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. He was privileged to be a priest, but probably looked down upon very much by the rest of the priests because his wife was barren. Verse 9, according to the custom of of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, Zechariah was in the course of Abiah. There were 12 courses of the priests, excuse me, 24 courses of the priests, and they would each minister two weeks out of the year, two weeks out of the year. 
So you'd have uh, the course of a bio would minister for one week. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, somewhere in the early spring or late winter, and then another week in, in the fall. And so they would have these two weeks spread apart by about six months, and, and they would go and minister. The, all the course of Abiah would go fulfill the priestly duties for that week. So they would come, and, and uh, it was his turn. And they, were, they were fulfilling the priestly duties. They would mostly be slaughtering animals and, and you know, sacrificing them on the altar and, and crowd control of people bringing in the animals and this stuff. But maybe once in a lifetime, uh, a priest would actually get the, the honor of going into the temple and actually taking coals from off the altar and going inside of the temple and taking those coals and putting them on the altar of incense from the altar outside where they were slaying the animals. They would take the coals inside of the temple. The, uh, the altar of incense was inside of the temple. And inside of the temple, they would put the coals in the altar of incense and burn incense to represent the prayers of God's people. Now, this must have been a very glory, probably, most likely, the only time that Zechariah had ever been inside of the temple. A very, very special moment for him. It's, it's the, the pinnacle of his career. He's been chosen, out of all the thousands of priests in the course of Abai, he's been chosen to be the one who goes into the temple to offer the incense uh, on, during his week. And uh, this was very special because the the altar of incense was as close as a regular priest could get to going into the next chamber of the temple. There was two chambers. The first chamber was called the holy place where you had the altar of incense and the table of the showbread and you, you had the candle that lit the place. But then there was a curtain, a very thick curtain, uh, be- between that chamber and the second chamber of the temple, which was where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was the Holy of Holies. And, and you didn't go in there, but once a year on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and then get out as soon as you can before you die. I mean, so here's, here's Zechariah. He's a very old man. All of his life he's, he's heard about the temple. If he's been in there before, it's only been once or twice. He has a great privilege of going in again and bringing coals from off the altar outside and putting them on the altar of incense and burning incense, which that, that one thing, the altar of incense, was the closest you could get as a priest to the holy place, to the holy of holies. That altar of incense was right before the curtain that goes into the Holy of Holies. It was as close as you could get to it. This was, this was the pinnacle of his career. I mean, here he is, and you've got to imagine he's, he's probably nervous. I mean, he's going in, he's bringing in these coals. He's, he's like, ah, oh, this is it, I get to go in. And uh, so verse 10, it says, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So outside, everyone is praying because this is, this is a symbol of their prayers going up to heaven. The incense uh, filling, filling the, the temple was a symbol of their prayers filling heaven. And so they would gather around on the outside and pray. It's interesting, we'll see this when we get to chapter 2, that there were two people at, waiting at the temple regularly, waiting for the coming of the Messiah, and uh, they were probably in this number praying as the incense is being burnt at this time. Verse 11 says, um, There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, this is a, a magnificent moment for Zechariah. I mean, he's... Now, someone might say, well, how does he know this isn't, isn't some sort of a demon? Or so how does he know that this is true? He's in the temple of God, Okay. If you go any further in the temple, you're dead because, because of the holy of holies. He knows what this is. You know, All of a sudden, out of nowhere, appears an angel next to the altar of incense. <laughs> and when Zechariah saw him, he, tr- he was troubled and fear fell upon him. That word fear uh, comes from the Greek word phobos. <laughs> you, you've heard of that, the phobia. You know, everyone, anyone have a phobia here? Uh, that's that's where the word co- that where our word phobia comes from. It means panic, terror. He sees the angel Gabriel as he'll announce himself in a moment, and he's panicked. He's terrified. He knows that this is an angel, right? Now, some people say, well, he, he probably had like 
you know, a thousand eyes and, and you know, ten wings, and he probably looked. No, it's not. What, according to the book of Daniel, the angel Gabriel has the appearance of a man. He, he, he looks like a human, according to Daniel um, chapter 8, verse 16. You'll see that. Um, so he looks like a man, but maybe he's glowing, or maybe it's just the fact that he appears out of nowhere. Either way, Zechariah knows it's an angel. He's scared to death. Because what would an angel be doing in the temple unless he's done something wrong? Has he done something wrong? If he burns the fire the wrong way. Listen, in the Old Testament, there were two men who were the sons of of Aaron who went in and burnt incense in the temple, but they were drunk when they did it, or at least that's what we can infer. Because when they went in, they weren't purified, they weren't holy, and God sent fire and burned them up. They're dead. Zechariah knows this, so this is why he's been very, very careful, I'm sure, up until this moment. Uh, make sure I put the coals in the right place. Make sure I'm purified being in the temple. Make sure I'm righteous. And all of a sudden, an angel appears. Uh-oh, did I do something wrong? You know, what in the world's going on? Verse 13, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Now, <laughs> He's coming to answer Zechariah's prayer. The, the phrase, thy prayer is heard, uh, really has the connotation of a long-standing prayer. I, I doubt that Zechariah prayed this a few minutes before he walked into the, into the temple. I, I doubt that he prayed it in the last couple days or the last couple years. Because she was barren and they were past that time. Estimations are he was probably 60, 70, or 80 years old. I mean, he's... Not having kids. <laughs> neither, and neither is his wife. <laughs> All right? So this is an old prayer. But he says, I'm here to answer your prayer. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now we'll ex- examine John a little more next week. So we'll skip, uh, sort of skim quickly through verses 14 and 15. Thou, uh, thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before them in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? Zechariah, you're standing in the temple of God speaking to the angel Gabriel. What are you talking about whereby shall I know this? It's like, how do I know this for sure? You, what more do you want, Zechariah? <laughs> Excuse me, you just saw an angel show up beside the altar of incense as you're offering incense of prayers, and he says, hey, I'm here because of your prayers. <laughs> uh, by the way, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah says, how can I be sure that I'm going to have a son? Um <laughs> For I am an old man, and my wife, she's pretty old too. And my wife well stricken in years. The angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. (laughs) Gabriel hasn't showed up for about 600 years almost. Um, I, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. He says, could I even be here if I wasn't from the presence of God? Could I stand here in the holy place? (laughs) You know, where do you think I came from? You think, what do you think this is? You know, I'm an angel. I come from the presence of God. Do you think I'm giving you my opinion? I'm telling you what God says. And the priest doesn't believe it. Now, next week, when we get further into this, we'll talk about how Mary sees the same angel, and she says, okay, what do I need to do? You know, she's just ready to believe it. But the priest doesn't even though he has all the evidence he needs to believe it. And I think as we examine this passage and we understand what Luke is beginning with and the way that he's constructing this, uh, the, the story, as, uh, how he's pro- portraying it to Theophilus, what he's saying here seems pretty clear. Theophilus, I know you need evidence to be sure, to know what really happened. I did the research, I'm going to provide you the evidence. But let me just tell you that when God does give you evidence, he expects you to believe it. When when you have all the evidence, you are now expected to believe. 
You can't just say, well, it's not enough. I need more than an angel showing up in the holy place and telling me I need more. Well, what does the angel say? In verse 20, I'll give you some more evidence. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. How's that for evidence there, Zechariah? Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. We are expected to believe. Now, we're not expected to believe without evidence. But when we have the evidence, when God has provided us the evidence, we are expected to believe. We could go on and on. I could go to Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Uh, excuse me, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. What does that have to do? What does that mean? Well, he goes on to list the faith of others who were proven to be correct. So their faith is evidence for us to have faith. You see that their faith is substance for us to believe. Because we can look back at others who had faith and God blessed them for it. Now we know that we should have faith, right? So faith is not evidence in that we just have blind faith and we just believe whatever we want to believe. You know, that's the right, same reason that Mormons are wrong. It's the same reason that Muslims are wrong. They have faith in nothing, in false things. We don't believe in false things, but rather we have faith in evidence. That's why in 1 Corinthians 11 we see Paul giving evidence. Uh, look even in the book of Judges. We won't go there today, but in the book of Judges, so what was it that Gideon, Gideon says, hey, I need some evidence, and God doesn't say, no, I won't give you evidence. He gives him evidence. He, he places out a fleece, and, and the fleece is, is dry when, when Gideon asks for it to be dry the next day, or, or wet when he asks it to be wet the next day. I think I got those backwards. I think it was wet first and then dry, but either way, God does provide the evidence. God wants us to believe on the basis of evidence, but he's given us evidence. Look at Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. You can't walk outside without seeing evidence for the truth of Scripture. It's everywhere we look. God is not saying, I want you to close your eyes and believe just, just because so-and-so said so. He's saying, I'm giving you evidence. Now look at it and believe it. You are on the, the, uh, the jury, if you will. You've been presented the evidence. It's now your turn to go believe it. Believe it. And Zechariah, who had all the evidence, who knew all, should have known, at least, the Old Testament prophecies, he should have known that it was time for the Messiah to show up. He should have known uh, what was being said about the about the prophecy of John being the Elijah that came before the Messiah. He should have known all of this stuff. All of this should have been very, very clear to him. But instead, he, he defaults to a place of unbelief, uh, even though he's faced with mountains of evidence for the truth of what's being told to him. Luke, I think, is, is hinting at something to Theophilus. Theophilus... I'm going to give you mountains of evidence for the truth of the gospel. But then it's going to be your job to believe it. <laughs> and it's your job to do your research, look at this evidence, and come to the right conclusion. And I think this is true. I think there's two great morals to at least the part of the story we've examined so far. One is that God expects us to believe when he's given us evidence, and he's given us a lot of evidence. We have 66 books of the Bible written by eyewitnesses to something or other. <laughs> Moses wasn't an eyewitness of the creation, but he was an eyewitness of God in the mountain who gave him the story of creation, right? So we have 66 books of eyewitness testimony to the miraculous things of God, and we're going to say, no, that's not good enough, <laughs> Instead of examining it and finding its truthfulness, God expects us to believe on the basis of testimony. He's given us the evidence. Now it's our job to believe. Secondly, I think we can learn a lesson from Luke. Luke sees Theophilus, and he sees these, the, other, uh, the other apostles may have been able to write a letter to Theophilus, but he sees that God has specifically equipped him to reach that person. And so he says, all right, I'll write a letter for Theophilus. And in short order, it becomes like the gospel that's shared around through all kinds of churches because it's so helpful for everybody. Everybody needed this written down. Now, there's no doubt 
in most people's minds that the book of Matthew, the book of Mark had already been written by this time, but it seems that Luke really, Luke's account really catches on very quickly. And everyone seems to know about it. <laughs> All because Luke decided he was going to go after one man because God had equipped him with something and he was going to use what God had given him to go after the people that it works for. Right? There are some people that I can talk to and I can go on and on about the evidence for Scripture and it's just... But then somebody comes along at work and just says, man, why don't you believe Jesus? What's wrong with you? And they all of a sudden, something clicks in their mind and they, they show up at church the next day. You know? Everyone's mind works differently, okay? God has given you the mind he's given you so you can use that mind to reach people who need that kind of thinking to come to Christ. You know? Luke had the mind that could reach Theophilus. Whether he was a believer or just needed to be discipled, whatever it was, he noticed somebody that he had a great deal of ability to influence for Christ. What we need to do as Christians is to find the people that God puts in our paths that we have the opportunity to influence for Christ. That's not everyone we meet. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try with everyone we meet, but don't think that everyone you meet you're going to be able to influence for Christ. Some people are just going to think you're crazy. But some people are going to be the type of people that God has equipped you to influence. He's equipped me to influence a certain kind of people. And so, when you find those people, go after them. It's easy to spot that in your own family. You know, your children, grandchildren are usually very, very in, well influenced by you, and you can influence them for Christ. But there's other people. You never know. You just keep your eyes open. You're ready to answer. And you say, when God gives me ability, I match that up with service and I find what God has given me and I find a way to use that for his, for his glory and for his work. That's what we do. That's what Christians do. Luke is just doing what Christians do. And he's, uh, unbeknownst to him, writing holy scripture <laughs> that we today are benefiting from. Because he's just doing what Christians do. Using what God has given them to reach others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may we learn what Theophilus needed to learn. May we learn not only that there is truth, there is evidence that supports the truth of the scriptures, but also that because there is evidence, we are required to believe it. It is expected, it is incumbent upon us. Help us to be faithful students of your word who study and research and do all of those sort of things and find the truth of, what we're, of what, what's being claimed in the scriptures, but not neglect living by faith as a result. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to learn from Luke as well. That we would look at our lives, our own tendencies, who we are and what you've given us and say, how can I use this? to be an influence to others for Christ. I don't know what it is for each individual in this room, but I, Lord, I do know what some of the things that you've given me. And I pray that you'd help me to be faithfully using them to influence others for Christ. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.